Good morning, everybody. Wonderful to be with you in God's house on, what's today? The 12th, 12th, uh, July 12th. It's the sixth Sunday, sixth Sunday after Pentecost, last Sunday. A lot of the readings, a lot of things that that we were doing last week carry over, just bleed right into what we're going to be doing this morning. Last week we were talking about faithfulness, uh, God's faithfulness to us, our faithfulness back to God. And then part of that, what we're talking about today, is our faithfulness to God. We call that the big fancy word sanctification, how we show our thanks to God, our sanctified lives, our holy lives. And and there are consequences, uh, positive and and also sometimes some negative consequences to living sanctified, God-pleasing Christian lives. And so keep that in mind as we go through our worship. I apologize to our, our media folks being so rude. Let's welcome, let's welcome those folks listening on radio, those folks uh, watching on the internet stuff. Uh, we do this, we had a few guests here this morning. All I do is say one, two, three, good morning media. That's all we do. Say that. Okay, let's say that together. Here we go. One, two, three, good morning media. It's amazing how many, how many people uh, all over the country do that. So follow along with us. So it's a cool thing, cool thing to have everybody along. Our worship this morning is either completely included in your your hard copy service folder or up yonder on the screen. And let's begin with uh, the start of our worship, top of page three. We begin our worship in the name of our triune God. We begin in the name of God the Father who creates and preserves my life. In the name of God the Son who has redeemed me from my sins and in the name of God the Holy Spirit, who creates and strengthens my faith. O Lord, open my lips. Give glory to God, who loves us with an everlasting love. Give glory to God, who gives salvation through his Son. We are gathered to worship God who made us and who loves us, the God who forgives us through Jesus and who feeds our faith through the gospel. We are here to worship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are here to grow in our faith as we hear this word, so that we can better live God's will in our lives. And let us pray. Dear Lord God, You have prepared incredible blessings for all who love you and remain faithful to your commands. Motivate me to be more faithful in using your gospel in word and sacrament so that my faith grows stronger and I receive all the blessings you have promised now in my life and for eternity. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Sing our first hymn, All People That on Earth Do Dwell.
Would you kindly stand? Dear friends in Christ, confession has two parts. The first part is that we confess our sins and ask God for forgiveness. The second part is that we confidently receive his forgiveness. This forgiveness comes to us in different ways. As I read God's word and his promises on my own, through the assurance of another Christian, and it also happens through the pastor in this service. Satan and our sinful natures want us to deny the reality and existence of our own sinfulness. Therefore, our Lord gave us his law to be used as a mirror so we see our sins and our need for a Savior. Using the mirror of God's law, I examine myself by asking, how well have I carried out my responsibilities as a husband or wife or single person, as a parent or child, an employer or employee, a teacher or student? Have I loved God with all my heart, gladly heard his word, and patiently endured troubles? Have I been disobedient, proud, or unforgiving? Have I been selfish, lazy, envious, or quarrelsome? Have I lied or deceived and taken something not mine? Have I abused my mind and body with lustful thoughts and actions? Have I failed to defend someone else's reputation in his or her absence? When we test our thoughts, conversations, and actions according to the truths in God's holy word, what blunt and honest answer do we find? We know from James chapter 2, verse 10, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Therefore, we join with the tax collector who said in Luke chapter 18, verse 13, God have mercy on me, a sinner. As a called servant of Christ, it is my privilege and responsibility to publicly use the keys which Christ has given to all his children, to forgive the sins of penitent sinners, but to refuse forgiveness to the impenitent as long as they do not repent. With penitent hearts, then, let us confess our sins. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a troubled and repentant sinner, confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as much as I love myself. I am ashamed and tormented by the sins which I know of, as well as those which I do not know. Heavenly Father, please forgive all my sins and strengthen me so that I change my sinful habits and live my life for your glory and not my own. Dear friends, as a called servant of Christ, I also have the grateful joy of reminding you of God's love and mercy. Our Lord Jesus Christ has forgiven us and reconciled us to himself and promised us the power to forgive and love each other. Relying on his promise, and in the name of Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. The peace of God's mercy is with us. May that peace rule in our hearts and guide all our thoughts, the words we speak, and everything we do. Amen. And we respond to God's grace, top of page 6.
seated. Our first scripture lesson this morning, the sixth Sunday after Pentecost, comes from the Old Testament, Jeremiah. I mentioned before church that a lot of our readings, especially Old Testament and our gospel lessons, have, have been coming from Jeremiah, have been coming from the gospel of St. Matthew. And I've shared with you before this summary of Joshua or Jeremiah's ministry it was, was not so fun all the time because the vast majority of the Old Testament book of Jeremiah is Jeremiah wagging his fingers at the disobedience of the Jews. They fell away from God, and God sent Jeremiah be to, to them to say, because you are disobedient, here are the negative consequences. You're going to be conquered by the Babylonians. King Nebuchadnezzar is referred to in here. You're going to be carried off into exile. But now, part of Joshua's ministry, Jeremiah's ministry continues, that he says God doesn't forget his promises. After the 70-year exile, the Jews would be returned. God will lead them back to Jerusalem, back to Judah, and, and rebuild the temple, etc. So that's what Jeremiah is talking about here. The good news that, yeah, okay, sorry to say you're going to go to exile, but the good news, God will bring you back. Jeremiah chapter 28. In the fifth month of that same year, the fourth year, early in the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, the prophet Hananiah, son of Azor, who was from Gibeon, said to me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and all the people, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years I will bring back to this place all the articles of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, removed from here and took to Babylon. I will also bring back to this place Jehoiakim, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and all the other exiles from Judah who went to Babylon, declares the Lord. For I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Then the prophet Jeremiah replied to the prophet Hananiah before the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. He said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words you have prophesied by bringing the articles of the Lord's house and all the exiles back to this place from Babylon. Nevertheless, listen to what I have to say in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. From early times, the prophets who preceded you and me have prophesied war, disaster, and plague against many countries and great kingdoms. But the prophet who prophesies peace will be recognized as one truly sent by the Lord only if his prediction comes true. That's the end of our first scripture lesson. Let's sing our psalm this morning, Psalm 89. Let's sing it responsively, singing the refrains together. I'll take the first line. I'm the P, I'm the pastor, you the C, the congregation. And we'll all sing the Gloria Patri and the refrains together. Psalm 89. I will sing of the Lord's great love for ever. I will declare that your love stands firm for ever. The heavens praise your wonders, O Lord. Almighty, who is like you? Blessed 
Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you. They rejoice in your name all day long. second lesson this morning comes from the New Testament epistle, a letter that St. Paul wrote to the Christians who are in the city of Rome, book of Romans chapter 6, that Paul is confronting a very logical thought, a very logical conclusion, that isn't it true that when we sin, when we ask God for forgiveness, we receive his grace? It's true. Now, if you take that logically, you can understand where the Romans, some of the Romans were coming from. They said, boy, if we sin more and we ask for God's forgiveness more, doesn't that mean we're going to get more grace? And so they say, why stop sinning? We'll just receive more and more of God's grace anyway. And this is where Paul says, no. When it comes to sanctification, when it comes to living Christian lives, we die to sin through faith. We say that's, that's where this, this whole growing in faith and increasing our knowledge of God's word and God's will plays in our life so that we stop those sinful lives. We're going to receive God's grace regardless. We have that grace through faith. And so Paul says, no, we stop sinning as a consequence of God's faithfulness to us. So we read this morning Romans chapter 6. Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like this. For we know that our old self, that's our sinful nature, was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. That's the end of our second scripture lesson. Let's join together and confess to the world, confess to all the people around us what is it that we believe has been accomplished for our salvation. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all working together to give me, us, grace and forgiveness. Let's join. I believe the Bible teaches us that there is one God, yet that one God is also three distinct persons who all work together for the salvation of my soul. I believe in God the Father Almighty, who made the universe and all it contains, and sustains it with his mighty power. He gave me my life so that I may learn about my Savior Jesus and be saved for eternity. I believe in Jesus Christ, his one and only Son, who reconciled lost mankind to the Father through his perfect life, 
sacrificial death, and glorious resurrection. I believe in God the Holy Spirit, who gathers and strengthens sinners into God's forgiven family, which we call the Church. He creates saving faith in a person's heart through the faithful use of the Gospel in word and sacrament. Even though I do not understand how three persons are still one God, through faith I believe this gracious truth, and I thank and praise this gracious triune God. We sing our next hymn, Love Divine, All Love Excelling. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you all from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends, I've told you before that I'm a history guy, and especially I'm interested in the World War II history, and in that enthusiasm I have to learn and read about that history, I have learned a lot of different names and titles for military vehicles. I think especially this morning of military aircraft. You think of all the aircraft that different nations in World War II used 
in the fighting of that war. And I have found that different nations called their, especially airplanes, different things. I've noticed that difference. For example, the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, basically only called their planes by letters and numbers. ME-262, the ME-190, the JU-52, different bombers, different fighters, transport planes, what have you. Kind of, my opinion, a boring way to name, to call your airplanes. But that's what they did, okay. The Americans, on the other hand, were much more flamboyant. They put a much more descriptive aspect on naming their planes. Sure, they named their planes with a letter and a number, the P-51, the B-17, what have you. But those airplanes were also known by a name, the B-24 Liberator, the P-47 Thunderbolt, the P-51 Mustang, the B-17 Flying Fortress. Those names that were added to those airplanes were to give a description, right? You don't give a wimpy name to those kinds of, of airplanes, a flying fortress, a Mustang, right? It would not make sense to call that B-17 flying fortress the B-17 sitting duck, right? Wouldn't make sense. Or you don't call that P-51 Mustang the fast, sleek, agile fighter. You don't call it the P-51 old nag, right? The Mustang, the Flying Fortress, they're very positive descriptions to those aircraft. Now you think of all the names that go along with Jesus, Jesus Christ, our Savior from sin. You think of all the descriptions that go along with Jesus. I would say most people, including ourselves, primarily and probably first think of Jesus in that very positive, wonderful, loving, merciful side, right? You think of a name like Emmanuel, God with us. You think of Jesus' name, the Prince of Peace. All of the wonderful, positive things that our Savior Jesus has done for us. And I won't deny that. Won't deny it at all. Wonderful truths to remember. But isn't it also true that our whole triune God, those three persons that we just confessed before, that our whole triune God, our Savior Jesus Christ, also included in that trinity, had another side, had a flip side to that coin. It's not all about love and mercy and forgiveness because our God also is a vengeful God. We see throughout Jesus' life and his ministry that when he needed to be firm, he was very firm. And so we look at Jesus Christ and his mission. We look at Jesus Christ at what he has done to us. And we look at that name, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Then we add a little bit to that, also carries a sword. The Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, carries a sword. And we see in our text here as Jesus continues to teach his disciples, we see in our text that Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, who carries a sword, uses that sword to fulfill, to carry out his mission. But then we also see that Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, who carries a sword, also carries that sword for us as we carry out our own individual Christian missions as well. Would you follow along as we go through our text from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 10? Jesus says, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person certainly will not lose their reward. And that's our text. I mentioned before, this Matthew 10 section is a direct follow-up 
we ended, we ended last uh, week's gospel lesson of the sermon meditation with the me- verses immediately before this. And in this Matthew chapter 10, the context is that Jesus is sending out his 12 disciples on a mission trip. This isn't a, a mission trip that's more a vacation. Jesus didn't, make, didn't say to make sure that his disciples remen- remember to bring their swimming suits because they're going to have a lot of fun on this mission trip. He told them, rather, when you go out and carry out my mission to you, the, the, Jesus to his disciples, you will be persecuted. You will be arrested. You will be flogged. It doesn't sound like too much of a fun mission trip to me. But in this process, Jesus is saying, here is the purpose of this mission trip to you, to proclaim what Jesus Christ is all about, to proclaim this name of Jesus, what he is all about, why he is here, to carry out a mission, right? Jesus wasn't here just to hang out with us sinners. He was here to do something. And this is where a lot of people would misunderstand who Jesus was and what he was all about, even including his disciples time after time, as we see in the Gospels. Yet Jesus says, here is the word, here is the mission, here is what you are to proclaim. This is where we get into that side, that picture, that reality of Jesus that sometimes a lot of people forget, right? We like to think of that merciful, loving, forgiving side, and we forget that Jesus, true Son of God, still carrying out his Father's will, has that important message of God's law to share. There are consequences to sin, and isn't it true? That when Jesus needed to call a spade a spade, whether it was the Pharisees, whether it was his own disciples, he was very blunt with some very harsh words. To call the Pharisees, you brood of vipers, you bunch of snakes. And those disciples who looked at Jesus as, well, they didn't really know how to look at Jesus. He'd call a spade a spade to his disciples. Oh, you of little faith? That's not a compliment. Or how about the time... Jesus needed to be firm, sometimes could we say violent, that there are two times recorded in the Gospels, at the beginning of his ministry and at the end, where Jesus cleansed, I'd say that's a kind of a a sanitized word, Jesus cleansed the, the, the temple, more likely, not more likely, the reality is, He got very violent. He overturned the tables of the money changers, that people were were making a profit, people were cheating, uh, going at the temple. Jesus cleansed the temple. That there is a very harsh side to the reality, to the truth of Jesus Christ. The Prince of Peace carries a sword. You look at Ephesians chapter 6, just what is that sword? That when we look at it scripturally, Paul says to us in Ephesians 6, this is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, the sword, the message that Jesus Christ would share, not only with the Jews, but the Gentiles, all those people around Palestine, and through the gift of God's Word, that sword, the gift of the sword, the Holy Spirit, the same Word, the same message that we have in that written book we call the Bible. The mission of Jesus Christ to share this message, to share this truth, to carry out this plan of salvation that God had set from eternity, to live that perfect, sinless, holy life, to die that cross on the death, uh, die that death on the cross, and to rise gloriously on Easter Sunday. That was the fulfillment of his mission. You think of Jesus Christ fulfilling this mission that, yeah, he did say some harsh words sometimes, He did have some harsh actions that he carried out in carrying out his mission to forgive our sins. But in the end, you talk about the violence. You talk about the harsh reality of what Jesus endured on that cross of Calvary. Was there there anything more violent, more radical, more radically negative than Jesus taking all our sins to that cross of Calvary and paying for them there? But again, as I said before, thankfully, this mission of Jesus Christ did not end with a dead body hanging on a cross. Jesus' mission concluded, really, when he rose gloriously from that grave on Easter Sunday. So we look at this Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, carrying a sword, the sword of the word, defeating Satan, defeating sin for our sakes. And now that bleeds 
automatically right into the follow-up that you and I have. How do you and I as Christians follow that up? How did the disciples some 2,000 years ago follow that up directly with Jesus' command? Now go on this mission trip. And this is where we get into those lives of sanctification. In our verses, 37, verses 37 to 39, have some hard words that don't sound like Jesus, right? Jesus doesn't sound like that loving, good shepherd in those verses, does he? Talking about the, the I did not come to bring peace, but I came to bring the division, a sword. I came here to, to divide up families. What in the world is going on there with this peace? What is Jesus talking about? That it seems contradictory. But this is when we look at the reality of our mission. How do we follow up God's command with us? Last week, I shared a couple of references uh, referring to, to the fourth and the sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer. And this morning, when I look at Jesus in his words, especially in verse 39, it makes me think of not only the first petition, but also makes me think of the first commandment and how we Christians carry out this mission that our Savior God has given to me. Right? Hard words in verses 38 and through 39. Um, Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. That when we see Jesus' words here, there is a connection with that first petition. Remember the first petition? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. What are we praying? What's the petition? What's the request? to keep God's name holy. How do we do that? Where do we learn about God's name? We learn about God's name in his holy word. That's it. That's the only place we learn about God's holy name and what he has done for our salvation. So how do we keep God's name holy? By keeping God's word pure, not adding to it, not subtracting from it. And this is exactly what Jesus is talking about. That there's all kinds of different reasons that people become split, that their divisions are caused among people. can be for some very silly reasons, can be for some very big, important reasons, that people get divided, they disagree. But what Jesus is telling us here, when it comes to the truth of God's word, we dare not as Christians, and what our Christian mission is, is to not compromise scripture, right? We dare not add to it, we dare not subtract from it, we dare not compromise scripture. And if in the process of creating relationships, whether that relationship is a parent to a daughter, a son to children, whether that's a relationship between friends, what have you, Jesus says, not compromising Scripture. What's more important, to keep that integrity, the truth of Scripture, or to maintain that relationship between parents and children? That when we stick to the guns of God's truth, to the Word of God, it's going to cause divisions. Not all people are going to agree with it. They're going to pick and choose. I like this part. I don't like that part. And it doesn't mean I have to stop being a parent. It doesn't mean I have to stop being a friend. It just means we're different. We're not going to agree. I'm going to stand up for that truth of God's word and cause a division. And God willing, someday, have that bridge built so that Maybe that division can be healed. Maybe that division can be brought together again so that that truth of God's word is seen and confessed by the person. A hugely important truth that Jesus gives us. The prince of peace carries a sword, and that sword certainly plays into our lives as we carry out our missions. And this too, I mentioned the first commandment. You shall have no other gods, right? Everybody here this morning is say, I never bowed down to an idol. I would never do that. God is first in my life. Boy, sitting in this room with a bunch of Christians, it's easy to say. But not so easy in reality. That my attitude so very often gets fixated with the stuff, the things, the bling of this world. That it's so easy to get my attention distracted away from my Savior God, my Savior Jesus and just get fixated with all the things that this world has to offer, all the responsibilities, all the things to do, all the pleasures, all the blessings, that, uh, physical blessings that God gives us, and let's enjoy them. Okay, thank God for all those blessings. 
But let's never lose that fixation. First and foremost, who is it that we love? Who is it that we worship and praise? Not my stuff, not the things of this world, but my Savior, God. Because he's accomplished everything for my salvation. He's the one who's given me all that stuff that I can enjoy and humbly use and humbly thank him for. But in the end, that's what Jesus is talking about in verse 39. Whoever finds life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will find it. it sounds kind of contradictory, but he's talking about this earthly life. I think of verse 39, and Jesus' parable of the rich young man, the rich farmer, Remember that in Luke chapter 12, that he grew all kinds of crops and he had such a bumper of crops and he, he said, I'm going to build more barns so I can store it. I'm going to save all this stuff and I don't have to work anymore. I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. Life, I have life to the fullest. Well, what happened? God took his life that night. Whoever finds his life will lose it and whoever loses his life will find it that when we do not, as Christians, make this life our first and foremost priority, we make our Savior God our first and foremost priority, there is the mission. There is the mission that our Savior God has given to us so that I have that saving faith and I can reach eternal life in heaven, but then also so that I share that saving faith with the people around me. It's a twofold mission, right? For me, so that I get the home to heaven, and so that as many of you, as many as my neighbors also, get home to heaven as well. The peace, the peace of forgiveness, the peace that our Savior Jesus has won for us, that's the mission that Jesus did for us and accomplished for us. That's the mission that we have to carry out. So peace, wonderful blessing, wonderful thing, right? To have peace in a family. I don't take that for granted anymore. So what a wonderful thing it is to go to a family reunion and have peace and not have to worry about Uncle Harry and making a big scene about a family reunion. Peace in family, wonderful thing. Peace in a community. Aren't we thankful for the means that we have peace in our community? Thankful for that blessing. Peace as a nation, for the most part, right? Not at war. Peace as a nation. We need to have some discussions. We need to have some improvement on some of the peace going on in our nation right now. But that's just physical peace. Dear friends, no matter what's going on around us, no matter what's going on in my personal life, or the community, or the nation, or the world, dear friends, we have the peace. Peace won for us by the peacemaker, Jesus Christ. The peacemaker who bears the sword, who has the sword of that holy word, which teaches us that way to salvation. The Prince of Peace carries a sword. He fulfills his mission so that we get to go to heaven. And now also we have that mission to fulfill as well until we get there as well. The peacemaker carries a sword. Amen. Would you kindly stand? Now may the grace of God which surpasses all our human understanding guard and keep us in the one true faith until we reach eternal life in heaven. Amen. And let's respond to this word that we've heard on the bottom of page 10, hymn 272. standing part of this whole COVID thing is that our offerings are way different. Offering plates are in the back. 
Uh, if you haven't already, uh, as you came in, just please uh, leave your thank offerings in, in either on this side or the west side too. Uh, and let's continue with our response of prayer there on page 11. We pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we join in thanking you for giving us life and breath, talents and energy, and all that we are and have during this earthly life. Lord Jesus, we praise you for saving us and giving your life as the payment for our sins. Holy Spirit, thank you for the joy and privilege of growing in grace through the power of the gospel. We rejoice this morning for the blessing of Christian friendship and fellowship. Keep us all faithful to the Christian duties you have given us through our families and jobs and free time. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private prayers. Make us more aware to see the spiritual dangers facing those who do not yet trust in you as the one and only Savior from sin. easier to hear when you turn it on. And now receive with believing hearts the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated and let's sing our closing hymn there. Bless our loved ones, Holy Father.
Good morning again. Thank you so much. I uh, just pointing out one thing in the in the bulletin number five there, uh, August second. Gonna be a couple couple of weeks yet, but uh, cool day. This is this is part of that that was whole all affected by the COVID reality, and uh, just a cool day. So I, I would say. Uh, if you get a chance, if you're going to mark one of the Sundays to, to be here and meet some people and, and be part of this thing, um, it's, a, it's a wonderful blessing from our God to, to bring in some some of these new folks. And and, and one of them, Alex, uh, will be uh, baptized as an adult. You don't see that very often. And uh, uh, just a, it's a neat thing, uh, neat thing. And so for you to, to be part of it and, and introduce yourselves to them for the first time, if you haven't already, uh, just Kindly put August second on your on your uh, calendars. Uh, thanks, thanks, Diane, and, and all. The, I, I said this last night. Shame on me for for not saying this more often. Of of all the things that go on, so that a, a church service like this happens with radio and internet and that thing and organ and ushers, a lot of working, a lot of moving parts to this, and so. A guy like Daryl Duso moving the cameras around for this and the radio. I think it was Damon and Ron. No, Ron. No, there's Ron. Who was it? Lefty. Lefty was up there. Is up there. Katie. Uh, uh, so many things to, to be thankful for as a congregation, so that so that we can do what we do on a Sunday morning. Sometimes I we take that for granted. So let's not let's not do that. Help remind me to. Oh, thanks, guys, for all that that you do up there and down here too. Uh, I think that's what I've got for you. Blessings. Blessings on your Sundays. Uh, blessings on your weeks as you live, as we live, to, to serve God first and foremost, but then also to serve one another. Good morning. Uh, right, the ushering out, right? The east side first from back to the front, then we'll do the west side back to front too. So, COVID. I'm ready for it to be done. All right. Blessings on your weeks. Mm -hmm.